So you see the insanity here. They, you know, people think California is an ecological state, but it isn't. Uh, it, you know, it's a ridiculous notion. Just a fabrication, a lie, you know. And uh, anyhow, I want to switch gears now. Just yesterday, I was going to do an interview in uh, the downtown plaza here in Chico. And, uh, and the question I was going to ask people was what they thought was the single most valuable asset in America, or any nation for that matter. But uh, there didn't seem to be enough people that I thought could, um, could answer the question. And uh, so I didn't have the opportunity to ask it at all. I did get into a conversation with a fella, but I, I think that uh, it was better left off tape. But, you know, I'd like to ask anybody out there if you know the answer to that question. And um, I'd like to state what Adam Smith, the famous economist, the guy that devoted his life to the study of economic principles and how it all works, uh, was Adam Smith. And what Adam Smith said was, uh, he said that uh, labor, the work, the workforce, was the single most valuable asset that any nation can possess. And when you think about it, even a little bit, you realize that's really very true. Because without labor, for one thing, nothing gets done. Uh, people will say, well, what about gold? You know, that's a valuable asset, or oil. I say, well, wait a minute. Without the labor, you'll never get the gold out of the mines. You'll never get it out of the riverbeds. You'll never get it at all. Same with silver, the same with diamonds, or any other precious, semi-precious stones. The same holds true for oil. The same holds true for real estate. I mean, real estate is what it is. It's what you're seeing right here. Uh, and if there's no shelters, uh, it's good for the cattle to graze and for nature, but uh, it's not suitable for human habitation. So without labor, you don't have any housing. Without labor, you don't have automobiles. Uh, you don't have the gasoline that goes into the automobiles. Uh, you don't have clothing. You don't have electronics. Basically, you don't have anything. Okay? And, uh, you know, it's so outrageous to me that so few people understand rudimentary supply and demand principles and the difference between that and what we have today. Uh, let's take gasoline for example. Gasoline consumption in America has been way down in the last, say, 15 years. Primarily uh, due to uh, fuel efficiency innovations and improvements, hybrid vehicles, this sort of thing, alternative fuels. So although gasoline consumption is down, and according to supply and demand law principles, you could say that, well, prices should drop unless there's a disruption in the supply chain. But if, if supply stays steady, then prices should fall. That would be the natural result, the natural effect of declining consumption because you'd have a superfluity, an excess of supply driving the cost down, driving the value of your currency up. That's what happens under supply and demand. And with industrialization, mechanization, automation, robotics, all these things, it has, over the couple hundred years now, it, it has made supplying our demand very easy, collectively, because all this technology belongs to humanity collectively because it was formed over time. It's an accumulation that our predecessors began and that, you know, that we have run with the innovation that has made our workload easier. And this is the object, is it not? Because we can figure out as humans, it's like an instinct, that if we supply more than we demand, our burden should go down. Our cost of living should go down. Our prosperity level should go up simultaneously, same thing, part and parcel. And your work week 
should continuously decline too as machinery and equipment is able to take over more of the difficult work that used to require massive amounts of, of manpower. For example, on a farm today, uh, whereby, you know, a hundred years ago, it would take a hundred men and horses to plow, cultivate a given parcel of land for growing food. Today, one farmer with the, the heavy equipment, he can go out there and, and plow the same amount of land in a shorter period of time. So in order to provide the food we require as a civilization, it's gotten really easy, exponentially easy to provide those needs. So our burden, our cost of living, that's our burden, should go down, in which case our prosperity level would go up. It's just, it's this, it's interconnected reality. But that hasn't happened. And the reason is because we've got price fixing. You see with gasoline in the last 15 years has gone through the roof. And, uh, you know, the idea, well, you know, they, people say, hey, well, yeah, I, I guess they're selling less. So, you know, now they got us believing that in order to compensate for lower sales, they've got to jack up the prices so you know they can't lose right so they keep taking more and more and more it's a it's collusion it's a monopolistic collusion the oil companies are all anybody that's got an interest even the shareholders say hey, it's capitalism go along with it when it's got no semblance of capitalism capitalism is based on risk and you know there is no risk anymore they, they've socialized the debt that's how they do it they, they, they indebt us further and further and they privatize the profits. So these people that keep telling us, oh, America's in debt, woe is me, we've got to have austerity and, and cut this and that social program for the poor, when they created the poverty intentionally, deliberately, they knew what would happen through this debt. These same people are walking around with billions and trillions of dollars and they keep feeding us this manure. And you know, as long as, as they get the word out there, it's as if they think that's you know validating them. When the fact is, everybody's waking up. Americans did not want the banking takeover of 08, you know? But look at the two presidential choices we had, Obama and McCain, and both of those guys were on board with the bailout. Even though we know these people pay very close attention to the polls, and this was the big issue of our time. Remember how it was timed, this banking bailout, right when Bush was leaving office? Remember that? Right during the heat of the campaigning and all that stuff? And we didn't have a viable choice. Okay, the only viable options we had, okay, of which this would have given, if either one of those guys were, 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 were against that bailout, okay, then I would have voted for that person because this is the most important issue. This is the root of all the evil, is this unsound God, this unsound currency that keeps inducing crime through financial desperation, that keeps bringing on war, okay, that keeps our problems from being solved. You understand, folks, you could tie this into everything, okay? Because if you start solving problems, folks, then you're stepping on toes. That's the, the reality of it. If you, if you come up with a cure for cancer, a lot of people don't want to hear that crap because they're invested, their job security depends on the cancer because they offer treatments, they do research. It's the same with the debt. Do you think the big banks want us out of debt? No, they want people in debt in perpetuity. They want your, your children, your grandchildren, your great-grandchildren, they want us all in debt in perpetuity and as much debt as they can impose without a, a revolution changing the status quo of things. So they're going to push and push and push. And as long as we accept it, it's like, who was it, Thomas Jefferson that said, that the exact amount of tyranny you live under is the exact amount you accept. So you see, it all comes back to money. That this is the one monkey on our back that we've got to get off our back. Folks, please, please consider the most weighty issues out there. Consider, step back from this whole scene and look at it from an objective point of view and take a God's eye view of this and what Jesus that he, 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 he brought that to us so succinctly, okay, and he pointed out these truths.
And that's how I'm able to point it out and, and know with such certainty of that what I'm talking about is the truth. That until we have sound currency, not only in America, but all over the world, we're going to have more and more people dying out on the streets. More and more people in the world are going to die of hunger, are going to die of undrinkable water. Okay, this is the reality. We're going to have the prisons are going to continue to be filled with, with people because of, of the desperation, the fear. That fear factor is going to go up through financial insecurity. It's the way that these people extract their perverted form of reverence. And they're going to push and push and push. They're going to keep testing the water and see how much we take until people just say, no, 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 no. We demand sound currency, which requires one thing, checks and balances, accountability. We've got to hold people's feet to the fire. So it's not enough to give a cost of living adjustment to people on minimum wage. You know, once we get it up there at the real level to reset it, reset it, and don't, hey, any people in the business community that complain about paying $25 an hour for every worker by mandate of law, then you don't blame the workers, you blame the people that manipulated their cost of living, that imposed undue burden on them. Okay, it doesn't matter if that burden came through taxation or through a private source. Burden is burden. It feels bad. It's repressive. It's oppressive. Okay, and, it, and it, 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 it's rotten. And unless you want it, then you should give a damn about other people experiencing it. You should not be okay with other, other people being oppressed. How can you? How dare you? Try to, it, it, you know, you, 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 you imagine that you're enjoying your prosperity. I mean, folks, see the end from the beginning. I mean, I don't need to be prosperous to understand I couldn't enjoy it. As long as the wealth disparity keeps growing, as long as poverty keeps exploding and falling on the backs of my brothers and sisters, how could I enjoy it? I, I, I'd feel alienated from the Spirit of God. I'd say, God, you know what? Something's bugging me. So I don't really you don't have a lot of inspiration, incentive to get rich when I know what that means, when I know I'm just going to live in fear of losing it. The nice thing about being poor is that you don't have far to fall. You don't have a lot to lose. So I can fully understand why people just give up. They get so disheartened, so disgusted with the system that they give up. I mean, what did Jesus say? You know, because of this system, because the prince of this world, this world system, to this day is still Satan until the return of Jesus, Jesus said you must hate your life in this system. In other words, you're supposed to get it. Whether you're rich or poor or in between, you're supposed to be opposed to injustice and to hate the rampant injustice that Satan, the spirit thereof, is imposing on humanity. Because folks, you want to be on the right side of history. And this thing is breaking down into only two groups that you can be in. You're either on the side of humanity or you're on the side of inhumanity. And to go along with this establishment, to go along with the status quo, whether it's the majority or not, whether they've got, and they do have a critical mass of people that are invested in things like the stock market through 401ks and whatnot. So there's all this temptation. These people know what they're doing. They know what they're doing. They're walking that tightrope. They're walking that fine line between, you know, pushing so hard that they end up with a bloody revolution on their hands and an overthrow of the existing powers that be, primarily the money printers and their political whores, I don't care what party they are, if they go along with this, this agenda of printing more and more money, debasing our currency, ever increasing debt, ever increasing wealth disparity, ever increasing in poverty, then they're evil, whether they know it or not. And if they're protecting this establishment, that's, they're going to hell. That's it. It's as simple as that. Because what's coming at this, at this return of Jesus that so many people are looking forward to and expecting, a separation takes place between the wicked and the righteous. So you've got to imagine that the wicked ones are those that are the inhuman ones. They're opposed to humanity. They are opposed to truth and justice and all good things. They, they don't want that because that means they're out of control. They no longer have an advantage in this world. They no longer have their power and control. It means a level playing field, folks, because in all honesty, be ruthlessly honest with yourself and ask yourself, what role will money play in a perfect society?
okay? If it's based 100% on volunt volunteerism, where I serve you because I damn well want to, and nothing's gonna stop me because it's an innate, an inherent instinct I have to not sit around and be self-serving and selfish.